So we're in a cemetery and we are following a very unlikely trio. We've got an older woman in her 60s named Jace, very calm and serene. We've got a 13-year-old boy named Brian who's sort of bebopping and cartwheeling around doing 13-year-old things. And then we've got a teenage girl, Lena, who is just does not want to be here at all. And Jace and Brian are trying to get Lena to appreciate the graveyard. It's very Neil Gaiman. It's serene. You can hear the birds sing, etc. And she's just not having it. And suddenly Brian's energy completely changes and he becomes very still. And in the distance, we see another woman approach a grave and he watches her really intently. And when she arrives at the grave, he turns around to Lena, he winks at her, and then he goes and he joins the woman at the grave. While he's there, he blows in her hair and she goes, oh, Brian, my son, I still miss you so much. At which point Lena's like, uh, wait a minute, we can communicate with them? And Jay says, well, yes, they come here to visit us, but it can be a lot for them. You need to find something that they'll recognize. Um, when my boys come to visit me, I send a starling because they know it's my favorite bird. And then Sarah arrives. Sarah is Lena's younger sister who has come to put flowers on Lena's grave. And Lena's like, what do I do? What do I do? And Jace is like, well, what will she recognize? And Lena struggles to think. She tries a couple of different things, but Sarah is deep, deep, deep in her grief. And then Lena takes two petals from a rose and puts them in the shape of a heart on her grave. And Sarah sees it and goes, oh my God, you're here. Let me tell you, mom, dad, since you've been gone, and starts pouring her heart out to her. And Lena kind of cracks open. And the last shot is us as the audience. We sort of pull up and away as we watch the dead and the living commune together in the cemetery, um, creating connection. Everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. You know, the podcast where we have great authors on, writers, creative people. Rachel is all of those and a lot more. And she's on the podcast and I'm excited to have her on. Uh, when she talks, I see pictures and that is what she does. She creates amazing content for us, written word and on screen. And I'm excited to have her here. Rachel, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to have you here. Uh, tell everybody where you are right now in this big world of ours. I am in the suburbs of London, southwest London, in a place called New Malden. Wow. And I'm like, okay, well, wait, where's the accent? Well, I'm American. There you um, go. Yeah, I've been living here nine years now. It's supposed nice. to be three years, and it's been nine. I'm not sure when we'll leave, so it's home. Have you now. have you picked up any accent at all? I have not. But my daughter has. Really? My daughter was seven when we moved here, and okay. she held on to her American accent fiercely. Until the last two years where she started going to the Brit School, which is a uh, it's an arts high school here in London. And now she's like, don't know. Do you know what you mean? Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's totally picked up a British accent now. I love it. I <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah. Do you do you give her like the grief for that at all? You can like pick on her a little bit. Like, I, I don't. No, I kind of. No. Okay. Okay. It. But um, some of my family members are like, "What is that coming out of me?" I'm like, "What happened?" Well, you know, she's lived here more than half of her life. So, what do you expect? <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I love it. Um, can you tell everybody what you do? Because when we met to have our little pre-chat, I was just like. I can't wait for this conversation. I'm so excited to have you on. Yeah. You um, you do so many great creative things. Can you kind of give us just a, a kind of overview before we jump into our conversation? What do you what do you? Yeah. Do? So I'm, I'll talk about what I do um, in terms of a Venn diagram. Okay. I love a good Venn diagram. I love right? it. Yeah. So I am a coach. That's okay. one part. Yep. I am a creative, meaning I'm an actor, a writer, a filmmaker, and a theater maker. That's the other part. And then the last part is grief and loss. And there's this sweet spot where all three of them meet in the middle. Mm. And that's kind of 
That's my sweet spot. Um, so I coach people through their grief and loss. I use creativity to help them do that because it helped me do it. Um, my first short film, Stillness, was written in the response of the death of my 13-year-old nephew in mm. 2016. And um, I want to continue making films and writing about grief and loss and helping other people be creative around that because it helps you heal and it helps all of us feel less isolated in our grief. There's a wonderful quote by um, an artist named Will Reynolds. I think I mentioned him in our pre mm -hmm. in our pre conversation too. He is a lyricist and a composer who lives in New York City, and he said the artist processes their life in public so that others can process theirs in private. Mm. And for me, that's what that sort of sweet spot in my Venn diagram is all about, is creating things that can spark conversation and, um, yeah, then help people process whatever it is that they're going through. Mm. Okay. I love how you've kind of drawn this out for us. Talk a little bit more about the movie side, like, and all of the film creation. Where did all that start for you? So that sort of started when I moved to London. Okay. So I moved here, like I said, nine years ago. Um, and I left behind a very vibrant career on stage I was producing some theater. I um, was a company member, founding company member at a theater company. Um, and when I moved here, I kind of had to start over completely. I knew nobody. And starting over when you're middle-aged, <laughs> it is not fun. Mm -hmm. It is hard. Right. It is really hard. And um, there was a lot of grief in those endings, right? The ending of a vibrant career, yeah. the ending of yeah. a familiar space, the ending of a tribe, community, et cetera. And I was like, well, what can I do on my own? How can I be creative on my own? I can write. So yeah. I started writing creative nonfiction essays. I started writing flash fiction, that sort of thing. And then about a year after we moved here, my nephew died and he was 13. He died on my daughter's birthday. And I really, really struggled to untangle those two events, right? And um, I wrote a story that's the basis for my first short film, Stillness. And mm -hmm. it's about a photographer who comes to a hospital to take remembrance portraits for a family that have just had a stillbirth. Mm -hmm. And... For me, it's really about the photographer. I know when I say stillbirth, a lot of people are like, ooh, that's the that's really the gonna be the heart of the film, but it's actually not. It's about a person who comes for their own reasons, their own pain, perhaps, yeah. to hold space for other people who are struggling, who are in pain, to witness, to um create evidence of something that's happened that they can reflect on later. Um, so yeah, it was the, the, and writing that was really, really cathartic, really cathartic. Now it started off as a 20 page story and it ended up being a five page script. <laughs> wow. Right. Wow. Cause you just kind of like you're, I mean, especially when you're making a short film, it's, it's, you take a fine tooth comb to it over and over and yeah. over again and try yeah. to keep it at its essential um, story points. Short film is really interesting. It's like its own kind of genre, you know, and you can feel it. If you watch a short film that introduces an element that they then don't see to fruition, like, or mm -hmm. see to a, a conclusion, you're like, yeah. Yeah. I want more. I want more. So yeah. you kind of have to take that fine tooth comb to it, make it shorter. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm creeping your IMDB while we're chatting. Are you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> There's like like a handful of things that you've done in your past. I have um, 
a most handful. Of my, most uh, of my career has been on stage, though, so you're not going to see that on IMDb. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> well, it's amazing though. You do you have done a lot, um, which is great. Uh, in your in your career, looking back on it, did anything stand out for you that was really really fun for you to do and be a part of? Um. Well, I would say there are there are a couple of plays that I did. Okay, so that's not going to be on IMDb, but we could talk about yeah. IMDb in a minute. Yeah. Um, there are two plays that I've done that I uh, like were transformative experiences for me. Okay. One of them is a play called All My Sons by Arthur Miller, which is mm. a perfect play. He wrote it in 1947. And uh, it's it's a stunning play about accountability in wartime. What do you do for profit versus what you do because it's right? Um, and it's an absolutely devastating play. Uh, and I got to a chance to do that the same role twice, which I haven't done very often in my career. I did it once when I was in my 20s and once when I was in my 30s. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Stunning play. And then I did a production of a Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. Wow. Do you know Twelfth Night? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I played Olivia. So like I'm in English class all over again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I played Olivia, you know, and I think most actresses want to play Viola because Viola is the lead character. But Olivia is this woman at the beginning. She is grieving the loss of her father and the loss of her brother she's in black she's in mourning and over the course of the play she falls in love and strips all of that away and is like this amazing happy person at the end of it and it's just such a joyful joyful play so much mm. fun um i loved doing that so those, nice. those are the two the the two plays that i like think about a lot um, nice yeah. So is that an itch you still get to scratch today or is that something Not you want to do? Currently, I would really love to get back on stage, but I am okay. an infinitesimal tadpole <laughs> in a very yeah. large pond here in London. Yeah. And, you know, it's it, it's hard to break into theater here. Uh, that being said, I have also not been actively pursuing that Uh mainly because of how much time it takes. And my daughter is yeah. 16 now. And I feel like the time is coming where she's not going to be around, you know, she's going to mm -hmm. go live her own life, et cetera. So I kind of want to, I kind of want to be home for now um, yeah. and not do things that'll take me away 45 hours a week, yeah. which would obviously be like when she's home and not at school. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in the right. evenings and yeah. all the weekends. <laughs> So, um, love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So take us through the IMDb, IMDb stuff. Anything stand out that you're like, what do you want to talk about? On my I, well, I would like any, I'm there's there's so much here. Um, any, yeah. Anything that's kind of like, I see a lot of shows I've definitely Watched. seen and I know yeah. for sure. Um, do you like horror films? Yeah. Okay. Did you watch Barbarian? No, I haven't even. It was the monthly but... horror film of 2022. Okay, well, I'm writing in my. I'm writing it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a. I have a lovely part in that. Um, uh, you, you're you're going to have to watch the film. But the thing okay. that's interesting is that um, <laughs> it, it the film takes place in Detroit, Michigan. Yep. And we filmed it in Bulgaria. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I got to go to Sofia for a long weekend and pull up into this studio. Like, literally, they're driving me around the studio and there's like the Acropolis. <laughs> there's, and there's like, you know, 1950s New York street scene. And then, and then there was this, you know, sort of suburban, dilapidated Detroit over there it was massive massive studio um but that was really fun it was um i only had the one scene uh but i really i really enjoyed it and just 
you know, it was the last scene that they were shooting too. So it was the, the martini scene, as they say, um, okay. to get your martini ready because we're, it's a wrap. Um, All right. I, mm, okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I take it you survived because you're here with me yeah. right now. So you no, did make I, it out. I play so. the shopkeep that kits out a serial killer, but she doesn't know that that's what she's doing. Oh, great. <laughs> so I see like Law and Order. I see Kingsman, which is like one of my favorite movies ever. Mm. I see so many things on here. This is so cool. Kingsman, I ended to... up on the editing room floor. Oh, you, you won't actually okay. see me in Kingsman Golden Circle. Uh, my whole section didn't make it into the film. Meh. Yeah, I had like a nice little part. It was like three scenes. No, got cut. So, but I still they probably didn't want. Look up. They didn't want the movie to do that well. They That's had to take you out, right? Me. Come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes sense. I love it. Okay, so. Again, uh, I'll put a link for your IMDb into the uh, show notes so people can go and see what I'm seeing. That's an, it's an amazing array of things that you've done. It's just so cool. So that that makes me a big fan, just seeing all that great stuff and hearing your stories. So you got me. You got me. So, okay, so now I, let's go back to the Venn diagram again. So you have your coaching. You have your Obviously, you're acting and all the things you're doing in the world, doing content, and then the grief side. So that sweet spot you talk about, what is it about that sweet spot that brings those three pieces together and makes it meaningful for you? Like, why why those three things? Like, you could pick anything. Um, yeah. You know, why those three things? Why is that so important? Well, I think it's the grief stuff that makes it, right? It's the, the grief thing that... Um, really creates the meaning in the creativity and in the coaching. Um, and I think that a lot of it, my, my decision to become a grief coach. So I, I, I sort of had this epiphany during COVID <laughs> when the world was becoming more grief literate because so many people were not able to do what they would normally do under uh, non-pandemic circumstances, you know, like um, I knew people whose parents died and they couldn't be in the same room with them. They couldn't mm -hmm. be in the hospital with them, people dying alone and yeah. that sort of impact, but that it sort of became this cultural awareness around grief. And after the death of my nephew, my father died 13 years ago, and that was definitely had a huge impact on me as well. And I think we expect to outlive our parents. So the death of my nephew sort of brought a lot of my grief into sharp focus. Yeah. And obviously watching my sister deal with that and my mother deal with that and the ripple effects that it had. Um and the way that people dealt with me. Now, I had I, I did not know very many people in London at this point. I'd only been in London for about a year. Mm -hmm. And I had some beautiful women who basically like, what do you need? Surrounded yeah. me. And then I had people who would see me and cross the street to avoid talking to me. So why do people do that? Because they don't know what to say. Okay. And I think they also are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yeah. And they probably have too much going on in their own life that they, they don't have the emotional bandwidth to deal with someone who clearly was like a raw nerve. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I never took offense to it, but I did note it and found it interesting, you know, um, so again, going back to COVID, I was like, oh my God, what I want to do is to hold space for people who are struggling. And I also want to be on this sort of arching mission of letting people know 
that that anxiety about saying something wrong, like you're not going to upset anybody if you bring up the person who died. They're already upset. <laughs> They're already deep in grief. They're already struggling. But by opening up a conversation and asking them how they are or asking them to tell you about their nephew, their mother, yeah. their father, and listening and witnessing to them, uh, that's actually the gift that you give them. You give them the gift of your attention and the gift of your time, and you set your own discomfort aside. Um, and I think that that's the thing that brings us in community and can make grief feel less isolating. Mm -hmm. So for me, these, like the films that I make and the things that I write are about me wanting to spark conversations, um, wanting to bring a question up and then have people discuss it and think about it and be like, oh, you know, I hadn't considered that. Mm. With stillness, one of the big questions that I got uh, very often was, is this real? Do people do this? And I'm like, yeah, there are charities all over the world that do this. And midwives and doctors and nurses are trained to take photos. Um, there's a whole, we partnered with a company called Flexmort that uh, is all about mortuary cooling solutions. Um, and they've created something called the Cuddle Cot, which they lent us. So there is one in the film. Uh, which is a bassinet that has a cooling element in it so that you can spend up to three days with your baby. Mm. Creating memories, naming, holding, changing their clothes, singing wow. to it, it wow. him or her, um, yeah. you know, giving them the gift of time. Uh, but I also had a lot of people, like when I would tell them about it, they'd be like, why would you do that? Like this uh, oil. And that's yeah, that's yeah. the discomfort. That's the like, why would you want a picture of a dead baby? And I'm like, why would you not want a picture of your daughter, your son, yeah. your granddaughter, your right. grandchild, your cousin, your family member? Mm. They just happen not to be around for very long. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I've had other authors on and guests on that have had a shared story to that and mm -hmm. just the all the emotions that you go through as a parent in that moment mm -hmm. to have to be rushed through the process I think is not a good thing yeah so that's a great option wow I haven't heard of that before yeah it's beautiful Flexmort has just come out with something that they've called the cuddle blanket which I don't know how it works in conjunction with the cuddle cock because it's brand new um, but I suspect it also has to do with giving the gift of time, having more time yeah. with, with your child. Um, so yeah, it's pretty amazing. So when you think about grief and work with people around grief, what, what does good grief look like? Not the Charlie Brown kind, but what is good <laughs> grief? <laughs> oh, I love Charlie Brown so much. I know. So do I, I love him. Right? Oh, Charlie um, Brown was a favorite of mine as a child. There you go. Well, there we just had we had a nerve there. I like that. Yeah. But what does the good side of grief look like? Like how do we do it? How do we do it better? In terms of the actual the experience of grieving, for me it's really about allowing. Um and a lot of the work that I do is about allowing. Uh, I think that we're conditioned and we've got a society that tells us to keep busy. Time will heal your wounds. You know, be strong. Yeah. Have a cookie. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of yeah. a, a lot of like um, uh, tr trying to fix it. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Right. And you can't fix it. You can't make it better. The yeah. only way to the other side is through and it's transformational. It changes who you are. 
and to to allow yourself the process to allow yourself the self compassion to allow yourself the the time and the energy to do it as you need to do it because everybody's mm. experience with grief is going to be different yeah because each grief is unique now there are some things that will be universal because we're human beings right the neuroscience of grief will be similar it manifests as depression you get brain fog your brain has to accommodate a massive change that um that shifts your neuro pathways and it takes a lot of energy and your brain is all about running efficiently um and running your body efficiently so you know you can be very very tired lethargic foggy um and all of those things are can be similar across people uh, so for me like experiencing grief or allowing yourself to process your grief is is about the allowing of it um and not judging yourself for how you feel if you feel angry if you feel relieved mm. not having an not being meta not having feelings about your feelings but just being being okay that you have complicated feelings because you're human and we're complicated yeah. beings um in terms of how you support somebody who's grieving yeah i think it's about being curious listening when they get upset to be okay with that and not try to stop them from being upset you know and just listen i was on a podcast recently um and i started talking about my nephew and i'm not sure what it was that made me i got i got pretty emotional and the podcaster just was like she she handled it beautifully um there was a lot of silence i just kind of like allowed it to pass through and then was like okay and then we just kept having the conversation but not to try to stop it yeah it's, it's okay yeah and you know it makes me think of that um i think it's winnie the pooh going you know we got to hit all the, we got to hit all the good ones hit them all hit them Charlie all Charlie Brown, yeah. winnie the pooh uh -huh. where he talks about you know how goodbyes can be difficult but how wonderful it is to love something so much mm. that it hurts to say mm. goodbye yeah. 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 And then there's a whole thing about how grief can be delayed for people. Mm. And maybe like in the moment when things are not sinking in and everyone's numb and just kind of doing the thing. You hear people who are, some people will default to all the facts. They want to know the facts, the times, all the things, the, everything, the dates. And they just, they surround themselves in facts as a way to cope. Yeah. There's the people who stay silent the people who hide. Yeah. There's the people who seem completely different than they are in everyday life because they don't know how to deal with these emotions that they're dealing with, right? But then there's like six, eight, 10, 12 months from, from that time when there's no one around and those things come back, right? Yeah. And in the silence of being alone in that moment, there's they've moved on. They're... They're doing they life. They've gone after the funeral. Right? Yeah. And you haven't as, you know, in your grief. Right. So where do you turn when everyone's gone home? Like where, where do, who do you go? Yeah. To? I mean, that's when you have to speak up. Right. But yeah. that's also, so again, like a good grief processing would be, I need, I need to speak to somebody. I need to talk to you. What can you listen to me? Talk about my father for five minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. But then there's also the showing up. Tell the story about the matchbooks. I love that story. Oh yeah. And I told yeah. I told it to a couple of other people and I think it's I think it's brilliant. Tell that story. Yeah, so that's Jason Harris. That's one of the uh, guests that's been on the podcast. Yeah, his book is called Good Grief and um so that's why it was stuck in my head when I when we started talking. But he came on and he does funerals and he does funerals for people he doesn't know. 
So he's never met them before. Mm. So, um, but he he says to the to the people gathered at the funeral that thank you for coming, but the family has really no idea you're here. Like, there's people in the room; they know that, but they're going to look back at that book that you sign at the back of the room and go, "Oh, <laughs> Rachel was here. Yeah. I didn't even see her. I didn't. Oh, Dave was here. Oh, was he?" Oh, how come I didn't see him? And they don't even know you're here. So he kind of talks over them to the community that's gathered to support them and says, These, this family needs you in the future just as much as they need you today. Yeah. But so to, to that end, he gets these little cheap wooden matches in a little matchbox where you slide it open and there's like 10 or 12 matches in there wooden matches and he gets a picture of the person that they're celebrating at the funeral and puts the information about them and stuff. Maybe some of the things that they're known for, some of their things that come to mind when you think of that person. Um, and he hands them out to the people at the funeral and says, now I want you to take this and throw this in your junk drawer because everyone has one, two or three of these junk drawers. And ev during the year when you go to light a candle on the holidays at Christmas or light a birthday cake candle or, or you just open the drawer to look for the scissors. And there's that box of matches with the image of the person we're here to celebrate today. Mm -hmm. It could be six months from now, eight months, whatever. In that moment, that's the moment the family needs to hear from you. So for all you gathered here, thank you for being here, but I need you to talk to you about eight months from now. Yeah. And when you see that box, just think of, hey, I'm going to light this match. I'm going to think about, insert person's name here, and reach out to the family in that moment and say, hey, I just saw your dad's picture in the matchbox in the drawer. And are you okay? How are you doing? Like, what's going on for you? You know, and that it's such a cool moment, right? Because it brings you back that connections reestablished again with that family, and in that moment. The family member, I think, feels supported and and safe when their friends and family reach out. Yeah. Right. You know, I think it's such a beautiful example of just a simple reminder that is going to get in your way at some point and make you go, oh, yeah. Yeah. The thing, the person. Right. Yeah. I love it. It's great. Great idea. Oh, I love it, too. It's so beautiful and so simple, too. You know, um, right. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Jason, for that. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah. Um so yeah, so I think I think all of us can do to grief better. Um and again, I going back to feeling alone, I think having someone like you to work alongside can can be that that helpline when there's no one else around. Yeah. Right. So having someone like you in our lives would be not an advantage. You'd be a necessity, I think, really. So can you talk a little bit about how you work with people? Because in that moment, I wouldn't know what to ask for. I just know I need something, right? Yeah, yeah. And know that you need a help, right? Yeah. You. Um, so I'm glad you asked that, actually. That's kind of – that's great. Um Working with me typically is I work with people over the course of about three months, uh, six sessions to start with, sometimes a little bit more, but usually six is a good, a good number. Um, and I basically will ask you questions about your loved one, about what you're feeling about what's coming up for you. I pull at threads of self-judgment. You know, like if somebody starts talking about their loss and gets upset, the first thing out of their mouth a lot of times is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, I don't want you to apologize. I'm good. I'm good. You know, don't mm -hmm. worry about me. You know, just let yourself feel whatever you're feeling. Um yeah. We'll, I'll usually give creative homework. 
So it sort of depends on what your creative, what's your creative spark. Uh, most people, it's easy to go to writing just because it's something that everybody sort of has, you know, right at their fingertips, even if they think they're not creative. Um, I have a client right now who um, basically like her creative homework every week is to write a haiku a day about what happened that day and how hmm. she felt. Hmm. And when I first gave her that homework, she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you want me to do what? I was like, do you know what a haiku is? And she was like, yes, I know what a haiku is. And I said, <laughs> look, like, I think that there's so much happening for you, right? Yeah. What I'm asking is for you to take it day by day. And at the end of the day, spend five minutes to distill it into 17 syllables, mm -hmm. right? And it was transformative for her. She was like, oh my gosh, like certain things come into focus. I, have yeah. an, I had another client. She was a painter, is a painter, um, <clears throat> and was struggling with the death of her partner and was reliving an argument that they had Shortly before okay. she died, her her partner died quite suddenly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, okay, I want you to paint or draw the event, like the thing that you feel is unresolved. And I thought it was going to be like a canvas. And she came back. It was a comic book. <laughs> like I had done like this whole thing, sort of charting out, wow. you know, with bubble texts and whatnot yeah. um and it just uh, helped her process what had happened and helped her process how she felt about it mm -hmm. um so that's like you know i'll meet you where you're at right in terms of your creativity for others it's music you know it just yeah it just kind of depends and gradually basically from being witnessed and getting a chance to have a safe place where you aren't judged, where you can feel whatever you're feeling, a lot of those stress cycles get completed. Yeah. You know, when we interrupt somebody who's starting to cry, you're sort of, you're interrupting a stress cycle that then gets stuck in the body. And that's where residual pain, physical pain can come from as well. Um, so just allowing, but the witnessing is a big part of it. My mm. witnessing your pain, my witnessing your loss, my hearing your story, because it matters, yeah. you know, and I'm somebody you don't know, and it matters to me. Yeah. It's, it's important. Right. Right. Um, I love that. Yeah. I love my work. I love it so much. <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> I can tell that you're not acting right now. I can, just love I can so tell. You're not acting. You're actually loving this, yeah. right? Yeah. You're not doing lines. You're doing life. I like that. No. It's great. Yeah. I love it. Okay. To that end, then, how do we how do we connect with you about all this stuff? Like, how do we do? So this? you can email me at Rachel at rachelfowlergriefcoach.com. dot com. You can also email me about creative stuff at Rachel Fowler Filmmaker at gmail.com. You can find me at rachelfowlergriefcoach.com. You can find me on Instagram as Ray Beagle, R-A-Y-E Beagle, like the dog. Um, and that, okay, so I did Twelfth Night twice. I'm going to talk about Twelfth Night again. Yeah, yeah. First time I did Twelfth Night, I played Mariah. Mm -hmm. And that's when I created like this, uh, this email, Ray Beagle, because my favorite line at that point was, um, Sir Toby calls her, she's a beagle, true bread, as like a compliment. So I was like, Ray Beagle, I'm a beagle, true bread. Um, <laughs> just haven't changed it. So <laughs> that on Instagram and on Facebook, you can find me there. Good. Well. I love it. Yeah. Um, before we go, we before we hit record, you were telling me about some upcoming things coming for you. And things you're working on. Can you give us a sneak peek, just a little mm -hmm. teaser about what's coming? I know, I know I'm asking you to, to show your cards, but there was a story <laughs> behind it that really made me, made me happy to hear. Good. Um, so just a little bit, 
just so that we know, and we're going to follow the journey, but whatever you can share about what you're working on next, I think it's powerful. So I'd love to share with the audience. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm about to shoot my uh, second film, which is called Somewhere Very Near. I got that title from Henry Scott's famous poem about death. Death is nothing at all. I've only slipped away into the next room. Google it. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. Mm. But it's about, uh, you know, like, don't don't worry about me. I'm here. Um I'm watching you. I'm nearby. I'm just, I'm just around the corner somewhere very near. Mm. Um, wow. Should I tell, should I tell the story? I'm happy to tell the story of the film. I, I, I'm all ears. Okay, great. I, yeah. So we're in a cemetery and we are following a very unlikely trio. We've got an older woman in her sixties named Jace very calm and serene. We've got a 13 year old boy named Brian, who's sort of bebopping and cartwheeling around doing 13 year old things. And then we've got a teenage girl, Lena, who is just, does not want to be here at all. And Jace and Brian are trying to get Lena to appreciate the graveyard. It's very Neil Gaiman. It's serene. You can hear the birds sing, et cetera. And she's just not having it. And suddenly Brian's energy completely changes and he becomes very still. And in the distance, we see another woman approach a grave and he watches her really intently. And when she arrives at the grave, he turns around to Lena, he winks at her, and then he goes and he joins the woman at the grave. While he's there, he blows in her hair and she goes, oh, Brian, my son, I still miss you so much. Mm. At which point Lena's like, uh, wait a minute, we can communicate with them? And Jay says, well, yes, they come here to visit us, but it could be a lot for them. You need to find something that they'll recognize. Um, when my boys come to visit me, I send a starling because they know it's my favorite bird. And then Sarah arrives. Sarah is Lena's younger sister who has come to put flowers on Lena's grave. And Lena's like, what do I do? What do I do? And Jace is like, well, what will she recognize? And Lena struggles to think. She tries a couple of different things, but Sarah is deep, deep, deep in her grief. And then Lena takes two petals from a rose and puts them in the shape of a heart on her grave. And Sarah sees it and goes, oh my God, you're here. Let me tell you, mom, dad, since you've been gone, blah, and starts pouring her heart out to her. And Lena kind of cracks open and the last shot is us as the audience. We sort of pull up and away as we watch the dead and the living commune together in the cemetery, um, creating connection. Wow. Can you make I that a it. little longer? I love it. No, I'm serious. It's so good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to make it. I actually um, this morning had a production meeting with my producer. Um so we're shooting it in July. We just finished a Kickstarter that um, we exceeded our our fundraising goals, which was amazing. Um, of course. So, yeah, I'll I'll make sure to to send it to you when it's finished. Oh, please. Yeah. Please, please, please. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Um, and where can we see stillness? Stillness is actually on Omeletto right now. Um, okay. So it's on YouTube. Okay. Uh, if you Google, I'll I'll send you a link that you can okay. share. All right, so we can see that. Um, too. Yeah. yeah, it's been on Amaletta just for like under a week. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah. Nice. You enjoy that one. Awesome. Too. Awesome. Rachel, thank you so much for being part of Living the Next Chapter. A very unique conversation with a very unique person and so happy to have you on. I would love to have you come back and give us an update in the future. Oh, I would love what that. What you're up to next, right? I would love that. I would um, love that. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, I love having you here. So um, I know our paths are going to cross many more times in the future, and I'm looking forward to every single time that we can. So thank Thanks. you for doing this. Awesome. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to Living the Next Chapter. I'm glad you stayed all the way to the end. You're my new bestie. And the one thing I like to do with my besties is enjoy time together over a cup of coffee. Now, 
One thing missing in the equation is my coffee cup is empty. And what I would love if after 390 plus episodes, roughly, if you found any value in the podcast and you want to say, hey, Dave, do you need a refill of your coffee cup? I'm looking at it right now. And you know what? It's uh, it's looking kind of sad. There's not much in the coffee cup. If you want to help support the podcast, I would love you forever as besties and celebrate coffee with you. You can celebrate and support the show at our website using our buy me a coffee link and all the money goes back into the podcast. And we also like to give it to other podcasters. So if you want to support the show, head over to living the next chapter.com and uh, let's, uh, let's top it up. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Cheers.